We have one or two issues, depending on how you want to count it, away from the N64's U.S. launch. Um, we are on Nintendo Power number 84 for August of 1996. Our cover game for this issue is Tetris Attack, which I covered last issue, so I'm not going to be getting in depth this time. In the letters column, we have a letter complaining about the RPG coverage and how there's too much of it and wanting more N64 coverage. Well, in time, your wish shall be granted. In the power charts, Tetris Attack, NBA Live 96, and College Slam are entering the rankings, with the latter of those three being on the Game Boy and the other two being on the SNES. We also have a ranking for the top five games in Germany, which is barely legible, and Nintendo um, Power Editorial staff, you, at least back in 1996, you have no excuse for this. You are pretty clearly laying this all out using desktop publishing software, so you should be able to see up front that this is looks like Garbo on the page. We, and that, not, not, that's not Garbo like Greta. That's Garbo as in garbage truncated for garbage. Anyway, moving on. We have more in-depth coverage for Tetris Attack, with some moderate basic level tips for setting up combos, which would have been nice earlier, but that's okay, and it still doesn't give us any information about what pattern the garbage blocks are when you convert them from garbage to actual blocks. Next is Oscar, a mascot platformer published by Titus with a movie studio theme, because when you want a cheap excuse to link together several generic worlds without having to come up with an actual story, you just say you're on a Hollywood backlot, because that's how Hollywood backlots work. Oscar is not as floaty or slidey as other Amiga-inspired platformers I've played so far on the show, particularly those developed by Titus but it does have a very slidey camera, which is also a thing that those types of games have. And that can make things frustrating, as while it lets you have a better look at the obstacles that lie ahead, it takes a moment for the camera to transition during that time your mobility is limited and ultimately leads you open to be attacked and hit by enemies coming from behind. It's a rough presentation that makes the game more frustrating than it really needs to be, particularly considering that otherwise it's just kind of mediocre. We have a preview of Gretzky 3D for the N64 with some notes on the general presentation, gameplay mechanics, and under the hood notes, like how they're handling adaptive player AI, which the way it's described comes across kind of like a more involved form of rubber banding, but on the flip side, you could l easily make a case that rubber banding is a primitive form of adaptive uh, AI. We're starting the in-depth coverage of Kirby Super Superstar this issue with a rundown of the first campaign, quote-unquote, with a promise for more next issue. However, due to the limited amount of game we have, I'm covering this now. Kirby Superstar is a classic part of the franchise for a reason. The game retains the incredibly solid play control of the NES and Game Boy titles in the series, along with some very useful innovations. You can eject an enemy whose powers you have taken and have them fight alongside you, and even have them be played, uh, controlled by a second player in a sort of younger sibling mode gameplay experience. The levels aren't as complicated as in later games in the series, and often are shorter, um, and certainly doesn't have the same level of secrets as more recent games. Um, but ultimately, that's fine. The Kirby games have never really been about super hard difficulty. They've been there to be fun and chill, and that's what matters. It makes for a really solid game experience. Definitely a more relaxing one. In classified information, we have a couple cheats for Nosferatu with a, with a different color crystal refill and a level select. I'm not sure how the level select relates to what ending you get, since it has a similar time sensitivity mechanic issue like with, well, uh, Prince of Persia. Next up is Power Rangers Zeo Battle Racers, a combat racing game based on the second Power Rangers series. I'm actually kind of surprised we didn't hang on to this concept for Power Rangers Turbo later. Not in the sense of like not using it, but bringing it back, since Turbo has a vehicle theme. Power Rangers Zeo is, at best, a painfully mediocre kart racing game. It is, at worst, a bad one. It fails to properly pace its levels. For example, having a Rainbow Road knockoff available in the early game, as opposed to having it be a later game, higher difficulty level that you have to kind of work to unlock. 
I cut some slack that this is one of those good but not great games that fill up the bargain bins at used game stores and stores and thrift shops across the country, but it can't even pass that bar of medium quality and high ubiquity. It actually goes for a pretty steep price point on eBay at the moment. We're still getting some Virtual Boy coverage with some coverage for Zero Racers, a polygonal racing game for the Virtual Boy with a behind-the-back camera perspective that never came out. Moving into Game Boy coverage for a bit, we have Donkey Kong Land 2, a port of Donkey Kong Country 2 for well, the Game Boy, with some basic gameplay notes in this article. This is more of a preview, but I'm reviewing it anyway. We need, we, we need to fill some screen time for a bit. Donkey Kong Land 2 is a much better port of Donkey Kong Country 2 than is any right being. It's still got some real flaws related to camera perspective, um, sprite size, and the sprite designs because we're still sticking with that digitized 3D um, pre-rendered character, making for a very muddy picture on the monochrome screen of the Game Boy. But it is a marked improvement over the port of the first Donkey Kong Country game with Donkey Kong Land 1. I'd still ultimately prefer to play Donkey Kong Country 2 more, particularly since there are more options now to play this game on the go, especially if you have a Switch Online subscription, but this is fine. Next up is Marvel Super Heroes War of the Gems, a Super Nintendo beat-em-up based on parts of the Infinity Saga. We have our cast, Spidey, Wolverine, the Hulk, Captain America, and Iron Man. It is possible for controls to be too simple for what you are setting out to do. In Marvel Super Heroes War of the Gems, like most brawlers, the game effectively has a two-button control scheme with the D-pad movements for various special maneuvers. The problem is this. When I'm playing as Captain America, who carries around a vibranium or vibra vibranium and adamantium alloy shield, I should be able to block attacks with the shield. I'm carrying a shield. It's one of the iconic things about the character. It's between that, bouncing the shield off things, hitting opponents from unexpected angles, and catching the shield back again. Like those are two of Cap's big action scene traits. I can't do that, though. I can't block attacks with the shield. On playing as Wolverine, my health doesn't regenerate when one of his defining features is his health regenerates. He's a person who you should be able to send in in situations where health pickups aren't going to be scarce, or you're going to be st stuck in a situation where there's going to be a meter that's going, when it runs out, it's going to start draining your health, and that will help make up for that. Um, I'm going to play as Iron Man. I have a dash. But otherwise, I move as slowly as everyone else, nor do I have any sort of hover to, for dealing with platforms, platforming situations. Um, similarly, Spidey can climb on walls, but he can't swing from a web. When the NES Marvel Super Heroes game I reviewed way back, years ago, gets the concept of playing a group of superheroes with different abilities, abilities across better than a 16-bit Super Nintendo game, you are doing something very wrong. And yes, even if this is like a straight one-to-one -one port to the Genesis version, that's a strike against the Genesis version as well. Next, we go back to the Game Boy with Mole Mania, an Adventures of Lolo-style puzzle game for the Game Boy. Now, I will admit, I ran into some issues with emulation on this, with the player sprites not quite properly, and a few other character sprites as well. Could be an issue with the dump of the game I'm using, could be a problem with the emulator, but it makes what could be easily be a very fun game very playable. I am going to try this again later on another emulator, maybe get back to you on this, but that said, the fact that I want to do that pushed my way through this game as it is, um, as far as I did, is a significant mark in the game's favor compared to a lot of other titles on the counter on this game, on this show. In the Epic Center news, we have some coverage of the new shared fiction project on the Nintendo AOL group after the Metroid project, this time using the Legend of Zelda Link to the Past universe. 
Our import game this issue is Fire Emblem 4 for the Super Nintendo, showcasing the latest game in the series and introducing the franchise overall to the West well before Mar Super Smash Bros. came out and uh, had us playing as Marth. We have a look back at various classic NES adventure games, RPGs, and strategy games in our classic epics section. In the epic strategy column, we have strategies on how to get the dark ending for Ogre Battle, which is set after the game I'm uh, currently doing a Let's Play of, um, Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together, if you're interested from that narrative standpoint and watching the rest of my stuff. Now, speaking of the N64, um, or getting back to the N64, it's out in Japan as of this issue on Nintendo Power, and so Nintendo Power has a whole bunch of coverage from the launch to get readers hyped. We have a Game Boy port of the latest FIFA soccer game, FIFA 97. And I'm going to be giving this game a miss, as I've mentioned previously. Sports games of this variety do not fare very well at all on the Game Boy. But speaking of Game Boy ports, though, we have our last game of the issue, a Game Boy port of Urban Strike, which I will be taking a look at. The Game Boy version of Urban Strike is, frankly, borderline unplayable. The tropical canopy combined with the monochrome screen of the Game Boy provides too little contrast to really properly aim at targets and combined with the limited number of button inputs causing problems with weapon selection, the game frankly becomes too much of a pain to play. Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of tips for Eye of the Beholder, which is particularly helpful to have. Going back to the Game Boy for one little bit, the Game Boy is getting a refresh and hardware revision with the launch of the Game Boy Pocket, with a whole bunch of notes on the new size, the new features, and the, the battery life, and for that matter, the change of batteries. We have another installment of the Beat the Boss column, with in this case focusing more on boss strategies for action platformers, you know, your, your Contras and that sort of thing. In the Now Playing column, the also rans include a double pack of Battle Zone and Super Breakout for the Game Boy, and Mr. Og on the SNES. Wrapping up the issue in Pack Watch, Outside of N64 games, we have Prince of Persia 2, um, getting back to our cinematic platformers there, and Donkey Kong Country 3 on the Super NES. So my pick of the issue is Kirby Superstar for the Super Nintendo. It's still kind of pricey at the moment, with copies on eBay as of this recording going for around the uh, 40 to $50 range. But the quality of the game and the amount of enjoyment you'll get out of it makes it absolutely worth picking up to play. It honestly may be the best Kirby game of the 90s. Next time, the N64 gets ever closer. In the U.S., that is. Now, that said, before we go, I have to wrap up this episode on a series. After I recorded my last episode, but before it went live, viewers, um, Bu, also known as Nier, took their own life following a long and sustained campaign of being on the receiving end of a long and sustained campaign of online harassment. Nier developed BSNES and Hygan, two of the emulators which I have used the longest over the course of the show due to their accuracy, their compatibility, and the fact that they played well with basically every capture program I have used to date. Long, like, odds are pretty good if you any episode of this show that you have watched like if you go back to if you pick one at random some of the footage if not all of it was captured using software that they developed they were subjected to a long and sustained harassment campaign through organized through various sites which specialize in this sort of thing kiwi farms that sort of crap and Ultimately, because this campaign of harassment, and it was harassment, it was, um, like, in practically the legal sense of the term, it, um, because it was not taken seriously, because 
they couldn't get action taken to stop it. It, from the accounts I've read of people who were f their friends who talked about what they were going through, it became too much, and they took their own lives. This is a tragedy for multiple reasons. Suicide, in general, is horrible. It is... It, 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 obviously, it is, it's, it's the death of a person, the death of a person who's felt that they're in a position where they had nowhere to turn and no one to go, no one to help them. And if you are watching this and you are considering taking your own life, there are hotlines available. There are people who you can go to to get help. And I will have a link in the show notes below to a master list of suicide hotlines across multiple countries where you can turn to for help. And I ask you, please get it. I I value my I value you who are watching this right now. I realize we pro very likely will have not met in person. Um, geographically, depending where you are, we may not ever have a chance to meet, but I do want you to know that you are valued, and I appreciate you. And, as mentioned, it is a tragedy because this was preventable, not just in the sense of getting help, but in the sense that what the, the, the harassment campaign at this scale was... Meaning, meaning that I am not a lawyer, crime. And when they turned to the law enforcement authorities, the people who should help them with this, um, they were was not taken seriously. So that needs to change. Thus, I urge you to write to your appropriate legislatures, whether it's the House and Senate of the United States, Parliament in out in whatever your country of choice, whatever country you're in, uh, in Europe or the UK, um, the yet in Japan, what have you, and ask them to create laws that protect the targets of harassment campaigns, that get law enforcement to treat these offenses, treat this, they, they treat this with the weight that it merits, that people who are subjected to this relentless hate whether it's just because they're a visible person online or because they are different because they're gender fluid or a woman or a person of color or otherwise LGBT or have a disability or what have you, that they are someone who they can turn to uh, turn to for help to get the harassment to stop. And we'll, we'll recognize that the people who are on the receiving end of the harassment campaigns are the victims here? They are not them. That 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 they are not. Put this. Not to treat them like they themselves have done. Like not that they will not victim blame them. They will not judge them. Is what I'm looking for. Sorry for leaving you on a such a somber note, but this, I mean. Nier is a person who, if I had ever had the chance to meet them at Portland Retro Gaming Expo or a similar event, um, my response is, oh, I, my, my response if I had met them would have been, oh, I thank you very much for all the work that you've done. My show would not exist without you. And I buy you a Coke, a beer, um, whatever your beverage of choice is. Buy you lunch. Um, show that 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 them that that yeah, uh, I value the contributions they do, and it was bittersweet when I learned about their death to see the outpouring of support and mourning and grief from all sorts of people in the retro gaming community, uh, people far higher profile than me. Um, this was like, this was like, oh, a few people running emulation sites. It's like Frank Cifaldi, um, the host of my life in gaming. All the, um, all these people acknowledging this, this very important contribution that Nier had done. 
And I wish this outpouring hadn't been posthumous. And I wish that the, that the harassment had stopped, had been stopped before then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.